steady signs of progress have to be commended when they emerge and two away teams have set Reading on their way to a potentially more promising season than first thought. That is the agenda for episode 166 of the Tyler Stem Podcast with your host Mark Mayer as always and joining me to discuss the 2-2 draw at Blackburn and the 1-1 draw at Aston Villa for Reading FC is Simeon Pickup, aka Bucks Royal, aka Sim from Bucks, aka the Tyler Stem website editor. What is your current uh, Twitter handle these days, mate? It keeps changing. <laughs> it's uh, Sim from Bucks. Had a had a mini rebrand, but um, if you see me on the on the site, it's uh, it's Bucks Royal just to keep you all on your toes. Yeah, just to make sure we know we know that you're the, definitely the man from Bucks and your sim. That's the most important thing that we uh, we need exactly. to know definitely. And uh, before we move on, I'll just add quickly the uh, the Patreon is always up and running for the uh, for the Reading FC blog that is the Tyler Stand, and we keep keep it running mainly as a sort of virtual tip jar, something for people just to thank us for, and it, it really is appreciated. We really do um we really do uh, like the fact that everyone um, takes the time out, and it certainly. It emphasises the fact that we do the blog and it helps us keep going and whatnot and all that sort of stuff. But it's also there as hopefully any people want to get involved with the website and if they particularly want to do sort of video stuff, that is the sort of thing where that Patreon money is going to be going if people are interested in helping us out with the website. We're always ready for new people and we have potentially some uh, some investments made to improve the quality of the podcast and the video and the website and everything that we do. So that is the Patreon's always there. The link is on the, the podcast articles and you can find it always on our Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. So without further ado then, we'll crack on and talk about some football matches and the Blackburn and Villa recap. View from the Tarhurst end. Recapping this week's championship action. Right, the first points of the season then, Sim. It perhaps took a little bit, or well, definitely did take a little bit longer than it should have. And we'll start with a quick look at Blackburn, which is almost a week ago now as we record this. And it was one point, but it probably should have been three. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of those uh, classic Reading games almost, um, where we look absolutely comfortable, absolutely fine until half time, and perhaps even until the first uh, Blackburn goal, to be honest. But just to see not even a, an entire team performance be responsible for the two Blackburn goals, but specifically one player just losing his head, i.e. Paul McShane. It's really frustrating. I feel for him because um, obviously it must have felt gutting for him coming off the pitch at the end, knowing that he's essentially cost us our first win since uh, since April, I think it is. Um, but yeah, it's frustrating. I felt we did enough in, in the game in general to get the win. I know we... Um, weren't quite as good in the second half as we were in the first. But it's just those two key moments that um, we're not able to keep on top of. We're not able to to see out the game. And we did have a good chance at the end through McNulty where we could have won it right in front of the away fans, but it wasn't to be. Um, I guess looking at it from a bit more of a positive light, a lot of the times last season we would have, we would have lost that. Um, to be honest, we would have lost that 3-2 or just um, completely completely thrown it away in the second half so it's, it's still good to at least get one point it's a little bit of a building block which um, obviously with uh, looking at the Villa game as well in hindsight we were essentially able to build on it and get another point so um, just small things to take away from it I guess. It was and the weird thing for me is that it's it was utterly predictable in the sense that we gave up the two goals but in the large sense of the word this wasn't a particularly reading of old uh, comeback from Blackburn. We didn't. We obviously gave them two penalties, but we didn't really give them many chances overall. And I thought it was very interesting that watching the game, if you took out all of you know all of the goals, there weren't that many chances created by either team. So perhaps a point in the end might well. And I think it certainly, as you say, does look a lot better in hindsight. One of the things that was interesting, of course, John Danny Bodvarsson got both the goals, kind of poacher's efforts, very nicely taken, both of them. Him making his case is an interesting one as we sort of move forward, and as you sort of say, Paul McShane destroying his, and Bod Varson, he's sort of a horses for courses player, the only problem is I'm not entirely sure which courses he's best at. Yeah, you don't know if he's uh, going to be prolific across the entire season, to be honest. I know he got a good 10-goal return last season, but you never really go into any game thinking that he is um, the obvious goal scorer, that he's definitely going to get you a goal. I know those two goals he get, got against Blackburn were very kind of um, instinctive strikers finishes. First one, a really good 
um, finish for the outside of his right boot, boot to guide it past the goalie, and then a um, very instinctive close range tap in for the second. But I think we kind of run the risk of thinking that that is going to mean that he's going to score regularly going forwards as well. Um, I know he got those two goals and he got the uh, the one against Derby as well, obviously. But going forwards, I still just think there's more potential in that Baldock and uh, McNulty partnership we had um, against uh, Bolton that looked pretty good in the first half of that game and um, got all the uh, the Birmingham game as well. So I don't really know what we're going to go with going forwards, to be honest. Um, probably see Bod Varson start against Watford against a, um, a tougher defence, but... Um, then could see anything on Saturday, to be honest, against Sheffield Wednesday. Well, the weird thing is with, with Bodvarsson is he did start the Villa game uh, alongside Bulldog, which, I mean, in terms of raw sort of characteristic talent, you'd probably say they're our best two strikers, certainly in terms of form and experience and whatnot. And yet it didn't quite click again. The Villa team was a bit different in the sense that Paul McShane was not even in the squad. Leandro Vicuna and David Myler lined up in the midfield, Probably a more sensible 4-4-2, certainly for the um, the team we were playing. But, you know, we've got a lot of creative talent in Liam Kelly and John Swift. Is that bakuna Myler duo something that you would only really employ for away games or something that you would keep up at home games? Because I'd be, honestly, really tempted to keep that in. Obviously, the Watford game is a bit of an anomaly in terms of the opposition you're facing, but I'd be really tempted to keep that in for Sheffield Wednesday as well. Yeah, I would too. Um, it makes it a lot more solid, a lot more compact in the midfield. Um, when you play two guys in the midfield rather than um, having three like we did last season for a lot of the a lot of the campaign, it you need to have players that are able to tackle, able to cover opposition players, really kind of get about the midfield and put in tackles. And when you look at John Swift, Liam Kelly, yeah, they're good on the ball, they're creative, but in terms of their all round game you need other players to cover for their role in the midfield. And you do just feel it's a bit lightweight when you put, say, John Swift or Liam Kelly in a two. But what you get with David Myler and Leandro Pacuna is that with Myler, you've got someone who can um, put in tackles, he can protect the back four nicely, and then Pacuna can help him out in that. And he's got the energy to um, get across the midfield to put in tackles, but then also drive forward with the ball like we saw with Danny Williams a couple of years ago. And you need that balance, you need that solidity and energy in the midfield, and that will help other players in the side as well when you've got two um, pretty attacking wingers are probably going to be starting Sims and Barrow going forwards, I would have thought, maybe Mate, Aluko, and then two out-and-out strikers as well. If you have two more defensive holding midfielders like Bakuna and Myler, it gives that front four of the wingers and the strikers a lot more licence to get forward. Yeah, and I think as well in terms of the, as you say, the wingers, you, traditionally you would need creative players to sort of feed balls in behind space, and that does work in theory with Barrow, but and Sims, who we probably know a bit less about, or certainly do, but with Barrow, we know we don't have to put the balls over the top for him, we just have to give it to him on the halfway line, he'll punt it himself and he'll chase after it, and that's where the attack comes from, so the the ability needed, the ability required to feed Barrow and to feed hopefully Sims and and whoever plays out wide, it's kind of lessened. It's not as it's not as high as one might think when you have so much pace on the flanks. You can kind of let them get on with it and have centre midfielders who who do other jobs. Moving quickly back to the strikers, then Sam Baldock against Villa got the all important penalty. He did kind of miss a massive sitter towards the end of the second half as well with a a ball that came in. I think it's from Sims and a sort of a touch onto the bar from the goalkeeper. Question. I mean, I sort of thought. Bulldog kind of didn't get the most of a shot that was really a sitter and obviously potentially a very good save as well are we relying on this penalty being the thing that boosts confidence or is it just the case that a penalty just is a penalty it's not really related to anything else yeah it's um, to be honest it's one of those where if it had gone the other, the other way if Reading had had the, the first goal and really dominated the game missed a lot of chances but then given away a penalty at the end, then we would have been thinking, this is awful, this is Reading not being clinical, the other team gets the luck. Yeah. But when we get that moment, when we get that real drop of fortune that we've been lacking for so much, then that is a morale boost. Um, I know it's not particularly encouraging that 
we had to kind of hold on and uh, run our luck a little bit. Apparently the second half performance wasn't great at all. But when you get those little moments, it gives the belief to the players that if they hold out, that if they keep it to a, a, a one nil trailing rather than going 2 nil down or 3 nil down, then they just need that little moment and they can get back in the game. And all that came from just a, a hopeful ball forward towards um, Sims trying to get in behind the defence and just making that run, making that opportunity can pay off. And that's how it worked for us. Well, it's interesting as well, isn't it? It's, you know, the idea that if we'd have been on the other end, because we kind of were against Blackburn, certainly. And I do kind of want to raise this point as to whether we were actually kind of lucky in both games, not just the Villa game where it's a bit more cut and dry, but the Blackburn, the first goal was a defensive error. The Villa late penalty that we won was kind of controversial. There was certainly nothing controversial about the penalties that we gave away against Blackburn. So I'm wondering just maybe whether we're getting a bit lucky. But we'll see. The luck thing, you know, if it carries on, then we'll have to drag it up a little bit more. I do want to talk about a couple of other things and more statistical things, though. The uh, dispossessed stats, which I've been certainly raised last week, that Reading were getting dispossessed far, far more than any other team. It was about 21 times a game. Against Villa, it was just eight, which is a much, much better number. And we won 34 aerial duels, 14 tackles. It just sounds like we got the basics right. And I think this kind of builds out to this, we've spoken about mentality so much over the start of the season and the end of last season. The mentality you need to win all those aerial duels and all those tackles is solid. There are foundations there. But one area where the foundations are still a little bit ropey is our start to the second halves. And we are still conceding goals at the start of second halves. Yeah, and it's worrying. It just makes you think they're kind of perhaps switching off at the start of the second half or or whatever. Um, it, it's hard to properly properly um, work out what's going on, to be honest, because the I think the goals that we've conceded have been a little bit different, but you look at the one that we conceded on Saturday against Villa and it's just, um, I think it's El Mohamedi who just gets in between our centre-halves and just has a, a relatively straightforward finish. And it's frustrating when it happens like that, but... It's then again, it's a little bit hard to kind of, um, from Clement's point of view, to work out what Reading need to do to to solve it. Is it is team talk at half time maybe? Um, does he have to, um, I don't know, change things at half time tactically or or what really? But it's it's something he really needs to to get on top of. I'll run us through what Liam Moore said after the Villa game before we just sort of round off. The recap then, Liam Moore saying we were slightly desperate in the end. I really think we deserved the point at least. The character was brilliant just to keep going. We had to throw people forward. There were a lot tire, lots of tired people out there in the end. It was disappointing to concede. It was something we spoke about before the game, the opposite winger drifting in. And he did that unopposed and he put it away. It was something that we could have cancelled out. But ultimately we got our heads down, carried on and we reacted really well. And... Reaction certainly is something that Reading have lacked over the last few weeks and months, and that's nice to see. So the question is, how different are our season expectations after this week where we picked up two, you know, going into the game at least, good results? Because for me, the relegation scrap fact is still there, but the confidence that will beat it is kind of growing in me. And also the confidence that there are signs of progress. I think that's probably one of the most important things that usually... We start kind of okay and we get a bit deluded or we we continue to do quite well or we drop off or whatnot. But usually we start from a good base and drop down and then there's that drop in morale really does sort of hit when there is no sort of progress or improvement. But at the very least this season we're starting from such a low base that any kind of progress and improvement is kind of nice and it's kind of bringing confidence and a bit of a feel good factor, especially with the fact we have a clear system this year or certainly for the moment. And for me, those season expectations, they're not getting ahead of themselves, but they're just drifting up a little bit with each game at the moment. Yeah, exactly. And we're just taking things as they come, to be honest, which is which is nice. We're just um, looking at each game and just um, taking the positives out of each one, I think. But to be honest, when you look at back at the, the Blackburn and the Villa games, getting those points, we were more than capable of getting those points in the previous couple of games. Derby, I think we could have... Uh, could have perhaps won it if um, that Manone Harold hadn't happened, if we'd managed to see that one out. Forest, we weren't really out of the game too much, to be honest. And the Bolton game, if we'd um, perhaps 
gone ahead in the first half when we were playing pretty well, we could have um, had our first win of the season. Um, but it's it's reassuring to finally get those points on the board to finally be able to translate what I think were encouraging performances into actual points. And when you when the team is confident they can do that, and when it really hits home that they are capable of getting those points, and hopefully a win on Saturday as well, then that will be great. And then the confidence will just go from there. It does certainly feel like Saturday, especially as it leads into the international break, is going to be so important. We won't talk too much about Sheffield Wednesday as we're recording this the night before Reading play Watford in the Carabao Cup. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But now we'll move on and discuss the various news bites around the club over the past seven days. The Talhurst End Podcast. Read the blog on thetalhurstend.com. Well, if Reading seniors are throwing away two goal leads, they're certainly teaching the under-23 something because the under-23s were 2-0 up against Norwich in their recent Premier League 2 game. Then they lost 3-2. However, they have since gone on to win 4-1 versus Sunderland with A.D. Popper and Chris Gunter both getting a good portion of that game on the pitch. Next up, they are away to Newcastle. That's on Saturday. So the under-23s currently fifth in Premier League 2 after three games. The under-18s... Their 100% starts the season ended with a 4-2 defeat at Villa, whereas they go to uh, Brighton, or host Brighton, should I say, on Saturday. And the women, a spectacular result for Reading FC women, went to Manchester United in front of almost 5,000 people and won 2-0. Really was a sort of the glory United game, as they, they always like to sing, as the, the homecoming for the, for the new women's team. And Reading went and won. It's the first Reading professional senior side to beat Manchester United since 1927. Now, I'm going to claim that as a bit of a stat, Sim, but I'm not necessarily trying to compare it. No, um, but it's, it's, it's great to see the women doing well, to be honest, um, in such in front of such a big crowd up at um, up at Manchester. That'll be a great um, a great boost for them. Good to see the youth teams doing well too. Um, Guns are getting, I think, it was 45 minutes on on Saturday to continue his development. So, um, yeah, good news all round, and we do need that um, that little bit of a boost at the club. Yeah, the only other time that a Reading professional senior team, and I use those words very carefully because they're obviously all kind of professional academy teams and senior teams that weren't professional and whatnot that have played Man U. The only professional senior team to have beaten Man U was 1927, as I say. The FA Cup third round second replay at Villa Park, that was. And, of course, we all know that Reading went on to uh, reach the semi-finals of the FA Cup that year. So no pressure on the women to uh, to repeat that feat and, and make history repeat itself. They start their Premier League or Women's Super League campaign versus Yeovil on September 9th. So we'll keep on top of that as and when it happens on the Tyler stand. A couple of other little transfer bits. Of course, the transfer window isn't quite over yet. There's, um, there's talk of Cameron Jerome potentially being moved out of Derby on a loan deal that we're kind of being floated around. Is there any sort of chance you think that's going to happen? No, not to be honest. We've got our main three strikers, um, Bob Varson, McNulty, Bulldog, and then with um, Mate able to play up top as well. I don't I don't really see it, to be honest. And with rumours like this, they'll often put out a couple of different championship sides. I think it's us, Ipswich, and a few other sides. So it just... It feels like agent talk more than anything else at this point. That's going to be a very expensive loan. I, I, I do think it, it would be odd, anyway, having having seen us sign so many strikers already. It would be odd to go and get another one, kind of just for the hell of it. I suppose we do have our, our four uh, first-team choices with plenty of academy options floating around as well. Another player on the radar this time to be leaving, apparently, is Pella Clement. Fox Netherlands have named PEC's role. Willem and FC Utrecht as teams who will be potentially signing Pella Clement. Um, we did a Twitter poll on this, actually, because I personally was not too bothered about the fact that he might be leaving. Seemed perfectly legitimate to me, certainly, if it's on a on a loan basis to get some first-team football. However, 46% on the Twitter poll on Tyler Sen said they would keep him with the rest split between sell and loan, which I must admit kind of surprised me that so many people want to keep him. Perhaps it is just a case of a keep on trying out players until one of them works and finally to round off news bites Nigel Adkins former Reading FC manager has been voted the fourth sexiest person in Hull have you uh, have you got any complaints with that Sim have you got three sexier people in Hull that you're aware of I can't think of three sexier than Nigel Adkins to be honest that that dashing silver fox that they've got up there on the 
I'm surprised he got as low as fourth. No, well, I suppose that officially, in the Tarle Stens eyes, uh, Nigel Ikins is the sexiest man in Hull. So um, if he ever <laughs> wants to come on the podcast and claim his prize, he's more than welcome to uh, to get in touch and we'll have a nice little chat about that. So um, in the meantime, we'll be discussing those of you who have gotten in touch with us, and most of you don't usually send us messages about whether you're the sexiest person in your particular town, the mailbag in just a few seconds' time. Get social with the boys. Find them on Twitter at the Tarlehurst End and Facebook.com forward slash the Tarlehurst End. So a couple of reaction tweets we got then after the Blackburn and Villa games. Bo Marrow saying that that is Mo Barrow the, the other way around if you kind of get what I mean. Uh, saying two draws from the last two Blackburn game very disappointing, but we move on to Sheffield Wednesday and hopefully get our first three points. Matt Cook simply say get in, and then kind of a bit of a theme with the next three or four, which I'm going to kind of all put into one, is if you can think of an answer to this one soon. We've got Luke Rogers saying that McNulty should start ahead of Bulldog and Sims should start. Decent defensive performance against Villa, but we got very lucky. Max saying, do we start Josh Sims against Sheffield Wednesday or even against Watford? Theo saying, I think Sims needs to start against Sheffield Wednesday. Made a difference when he came on versus Villa. Created the chance for Bulldog when he missed the sitter and he won us the penalty as well. And Bilal Benassa saying... Why don't we play a Luco in his best position in behind the striker and play Sims and Barrow or Mate on the wings? I never understood why we didn't play a Luco behind the striker. That's where he was most dangerous at for Fulham. So Sims, I think against Watford, it's pretty much nailed on that we're going to see Josh Sims start. And I suppose from then on, the, the attack is probably going to take shape depending on who can impress against Watford. And if no one impresses, then we'll just play how we played against Villa. Yeah, exactly. Um, and wingers are very important for us at the moment. I thought our um, perhaps our biggest failing in our last home game against Bolton was a lack of width. I know we had Mate down the right and kind of Swift played in a kind of a cutting in role from the left. But that lack of width, because they both try and cut in quite a lot, really um, really held us back. But now we've got Barrow back and Sims coming into the team as well, of course. It gives us a lot more pace, a lot more... Um, much more of a direct option going down both flanks and particularly if both of them impress against Watford I think Sims is probably more likely to play than Barrow um, considering Barrow only got I think about 45 minutes on Saturday Um, but if one or two of them can impress then there's no reason why they can't get into the side for for Wednesday because those that position out wide does seem to be quite fluid at the moment with the Luco starting as well and Mate too. So if someone puts in a really good performance or gets a goal even or an assist or two, then there's no reason why they can't really stake a claim. Do you have any interest in the idea of a Luco playing with sort of I would I would have Sims and Barrow on the wings as as Blair kind of mentions, but a Luco in behind, probably Bulldog, I suppose. In theory, there's a lot of experience and a lot of goals in that front line, but I'm, I don't know about Aluko being behind the striker in practice because he seems, if he's out on the flanks, he doesn't create anywhere near enough for them to move him into the chief creative position. And I'm happy to be proved wrong if, if Paul Clement ever goes with it, but just at the moment it seems like playing someone behind the striker, you have to be absolutely 100% sure that they can take chances and that they can make chances. And Aluko at Reading for you know not just the last couple of weeks, but since he's arrived hasn't shown the ability to do that consistently. No, I'm not sure what his, um, his best position is, to be honest. I think at Fulham he kind of tended to play on the right of a of a front three, but he also kind of lined up as a as a false nine a little bit as well. But the problem with his spell at Reading is that he often goes out on the right and then rather than um, staying wide and hugging the touchline and really giving us a lot of width, far too often, particularly last season, he'd cut in, um, inside and deep as well. So we kind of pack our midfield where he wants to, I think, pick up the ball and um, get into possession and really try and make things happen. But he doesn't get up the pitch enough. He doesn't run at defences enough. I think I looked at his stats for the um, for the derby game on the opening um, on the opening weekend, and his number of touches in the final third was minimal. He doesn't seem to want to kind of get into those key positions run with the ball at a defence and really try and open things up around the opposition goal. Maybe that would work a little bit better with him off the striker. I seem to remember him playing that kind of role of way at Leeds last season where we actually got a win for a change. 
but I'm, I'm not too sure, to be honest. At this moment, I'd prefer McNulty in that role where we kind of had him and Bulldog up front against Bolton. And what I really liked about that system was that you have Bulldog leading the line and then McNulty kind of dropping off, finding space and then moving the opposition defenders around and really making it a fluid attack. I guess Aluko is naturally suited to that kind of interchange, that looking for space and then picking up the ball, but he's got other competition to, to go up against. Certainly has a long way to go to get. I suppose he's in the team, so he's not too far away, but certainly has a long way to go to start being the, uh, the sort of player that Clement builds the team around, and certainly as he's, Clement's looking for this 4-4-2 formation. Final question then comes from Dinkman Dennis, who says, do you see us being moronic enough, as he puts it, to actually drop Yadom for Gunter when he returns from injury, or will we keep it the same, or even put him at left back? Now, I don't think Yadom is going to go anywhere, because I think even Clement will know that he's been one of the better players so far this season, barring any sort of errors as soon as I say this. But I think Gunter's he's going to be floating around on the bench, and Paul Clement has not been afraid to change fullbacks off the uh, off the bench and whatnot. And I do think that we'll see Gunter on the pitch for definite, but we won't necessarily see him starting games. And and who knows, maybe Clement will, will enact a sort of rotation policy. Do you see him dropping in at left-back? No, I don't, to be honest. I actually quite like what Tyler Black has done this season. I think he's come along very nicely. His all-round confidence and composure on and off the ball seem to be a lot better. And it says a lot that, despite looking... Um, well, very shaky to say the least last season. He's been picked consistently by Paul Clement this season, despite Omar Richards being an option, um, despite Andy Yeard on being to, able to play there as well. So I don't see Blackett coming out of the side and Andy Yeard on done even better than him. Um, added a lot more attacking impetus down the right. He gets forward a lot better. He seems to get in behind the opposition defence quite nicely. Um and I don't really see Gunter adding, adding anything more on either side, to be honest. But I guess he's a logical person to have on the bench, having that experience and versatility if you need to bring him on as a as a right back or a left back or wherever, to be honest. He, um, he should be uh, involved, but just in general, I don't see him starting too many games. I wouldn't want to rule out the idea that Chris Gunter starts at right back with Yadom at right mid in, in tough away games, but certainly not. I, I couldn't see that happening at home. And, and yeah, at left back, I think that Tyler Blackett's credit to him. He's a sort of a spotlight player. Whatever he does gets magnified and discussed probably more than the majority, of, certainly more than the majority of the squad. I can't think of many other players who have the spotlight on him. Maybe Liam Moore probably at the moment at Reading, but whenever... He's uh, been asked a bit but this season. He's not done a bad job, so credit to him for uh, for stepping up. And certainly I, I was a massive fan of one Sean Cummings for doing pretty much the same sort of job in uh, in terms of how he started to how he finished at Reading. So hopefully Tyler Blackett can be of that ilk. And we'll be discussing exactly whether Tyler Blackett and Gunter and whatnot will be starting against Watford on Wednesday as we give that a quick little preview to round off the show. The Tarlhurst End Podcast by Reading fans. Fans. So, Sim, forget who you think is going to come in for this game. Who do you want to see start at the Medeski Stadium against Watford on Wednesday evening in the Carabao Cup? We have a clean slate. We've beaten a team. And surely, if on Little Football Manager you've got the where the board expects us to get to, surely the Reading board expects Reading to get to you know, second round defeat or maybe a penalty defeat at home to a Premier League club, they probably wouldn't be too bothered. So the pressure's off. Who do you want to see come into the team? I'd like to see a, a, just a few tactical changes, to be honest. We've had our 4-4-2 four, four, over the last couple of weeks. I'd like to see us just tweak it a little bit and try a, a slightly different interpretation of it. On the um, the first game against Derby, we had kind of a 4-4-1-1 a four, four, one, one with Swift playing off Bod Vars. And I think if we go back to that, it gives us... Um, a few more options in midfield, it kind of tightens it up a little bit against a um, a Watford side that like to, um, they've got a lot of quality in the midfield, so we are going to need to bring someone else in there to just make it a little bit tougher for them. Um, I guess otherwise, giving Richards a chance instead of Blackett, give him a rest, but generally speaking, try and put out a strong side, try and get the win, as we did in the last round, just trying to build that momentum, trying to build that that confidence and rather than just rotating for rotation's sake 
if we can get a morale boosting, even a, a, a score loss, just really putting in a, a, a good performance and maybe losing 2-1 or 3-2 or whatever, even that will build confidence and really give us a bit of uh, belief going into Saturday. And that's the, that's the most important thing. Yeah, I think it is. Um, it is important to sort of obviously keep the the results flowing, and those those certainly do translate um, from game to game. It's I don't know about who I'd, I'd want to see necessarily. I think Josh Sims starting is very important. I think, as you say, Richards being rotated in. We can't forget the fact that we, you know, there are a growing number of players in the team that have featured certainly quite heavily or more consistently um, than certain others. I think Gunter, the fact he played 45 minutes on the weekend for the under-23s, probably suggests that he'll play. Whether he plays the entire game or not um, remains to be seen. I'll certainly be happy to see him play. And McNulty coming in, I'd probably see, expect to see Swift as well because I think we're probably going to go in with a kind of 4-4-1-1, maybe just have that extra man in midfield to do a little bit more... Um, a little bit more creative and a little more chasing of the game if we have to. The thing is as well with this game is we have no idea how Watford are going to approach it. Javi Grassi, the current manager, has only played one cup game in England. That came six days after joining. So there's really there's no precedent for knowing what Watford are going to do in terms of their lineup, how seriously they're going to take it. So really, it's hard to tell. But with that in mind, um, can I have a prediction, please? Oh, uh, tough one. Um, I am going to echo our last um, Premier League uh, League Cup game that Medeski can go with a 2-0 away win after Swansea did the same thing last year. Just to clarify again, because obviously the first round didn't have extra time, the extra time possibility in this round is uh, non-existent. Goes straight to penalty, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so that's a nice, easy one for those of you organising uh, lifts and whatnot out of the uh, what time you're going to get home. If, you tell, if your partner tells you that they're going to extra time, and um, and they've said, oh yeah, there's extra time. Then they're cheating on you, I'm afraid. So just uh, <laughs> make sure you know that, and uh, make sure you're you're well well abreast of the uh, of the rules and whatnot for the second round of the League Cup. I myself am probably going to have to predict a one-one draw. I think I said the same for the Birmingham game, but I certainly do think that uh, that Watford will score, and I think Reading will probably grab on as well. And uh, I mean, if we lose on penalties after one-one draw, I think I will probably take that. Let's just round off the episode then with a quick look at how the Prediction League is going because certain Mr. Dan Wimbush, the former host and hopefully one-time returnee or future returnee of the Tyler Sen podcast, is storming away with the league at the moment with nine points. He's correctly predicted the Derby, Forest and now the Villa result. Uh, he was joined in the Villa result by the 1-1 merchant known as Simeon Pickup on Saturday with a 1-1 draw that came off. So... Five predictions of one one, and you've got some uh, got some points for it now. Exactly, consistency pays off in this sport, both uh, both in terms of the actual game and the prediction league. So I'm delighted to get my first points. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Tom Crock is currently on the single point with uh, Westy, Johnny, and Handbags all on two. Myself on three, and Ollie Allen on four. Ollie will be around on uh, Thursday, usually as for the weekend preview, talking about the Sheffield Wednesday game. And the final point I was going to make is that the old if the predictions were correct. You can kind of see the fact that Tom Crocker's predictions have come out as the most optimistic at the moment. With uh, If his predictions are correct, we'd be on seven points Reading as opposed to the two. So there's certainly not a great case for being optimistic in the predictions, as you probably would have worked out by now. So, quick word for Sheffield Wednesday then, to round us off. Uh, it's, it's so important to win this game, I think. Before the international break, do you foresee... If say we lose it, do you foresee any sort of last ditch runs into the, um, you know, sort of immediate changes to the team? Sort of, is it is it panic stations going to return if we lose this game? I think it depends how we lose it. To be honest, if we lose it comfortably, then obviously we're going to be really worried that we're going backwards after getting our first points. But if it's say a high scoring loss and we kind of get edged out despite playing really well, then it's it's not too bad. It's more just about um, um, what we can get out of it all round, really. But obviously, we do need that win. Well, thank you for joining me this evening, then, Sim, to uh, discuss all things Reading FC. And we have two home games. We ended last 
week show saying we had two away games. We can still be positive. We can still get something from it. And you know what? We did. So we're going to end this show in exactly the same way. We have two home games now before the international break. Something to enjoy. Two teams that we can actually beat. And who knows? Maybe we'll be talking in a week's time with not just one, but a couple of vital wins in the bag for Reading FC. Come on, you ass. Just us.